It's a Wednesday and it's time for our weekly feature, Going Green. Tonight we're focusing on biofuel, which is energy from recently lifeless or living matter. Examples include ethanol made from corn or sugarcane, biodiesel made from vegetable oils, or green diesel made from algae. Unlike oil and gas, biofuel is clean and renewable, meaning it's very important for the world in terms of controlling carbon emissions uh, contributing to climate change at the moment. The Worldwide Fund for Nature has released a report saying biofuel production in sub-Saharan Africa should be prioritized for aviation. To discuss, we're joined by Tiasa Bolerintel, WWF's bioenergy program manager. Uh, she joins us via Skype. Thank you for being with us, Ms. Bolerintel. Uh, before sub-Saharan Africa is even a big player in biofuel, I don't think we are, why are you saying it should go to aviation directing where the fuel goes? Good evening. Um well, the focus on aviation is because um, aviation um, uh, air traffic is projected to um, grow um, exponentially, and our estimates suggest that by 2050, more than 20% of uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emissions can come from the aviation sector. Now, um, that is a problem as we're trying to decarbonize and keep our uh, uh, global warming to two degrees or, or one and a half degree, um, and the aviation sector. Um, in contrast to other transportation sectors, has more limited options to reduce their emissions. So for road transportation, um, um, electric vehicles, um, the uh, model shift, so more road to rail um, and hydrogen. Um, so there, um, there are other, there are a, a number of possibilities which are not uh, currently um, an option in the, for the aviation sector. So there, there's, the aviation sector is limited to um, smallish improvements in aircraft design, some operational improvements, but really they need um, low carbon fuels to help them reduce their overall emissions. So are you saying at some point airlines will want to be green, uh, but they may not be able to get their hands on enough green energy, biofuel? That's correct. So um, there are international uh, policy developments that are trying to um, to get uh, airlines to uh, to join um, um, an international scheme for emission reduction in international aviation, and they there they can use either carbon offsets or uh, low carbon fuels. And low carbon fuels is not anymore synonymous with biofuels because of some recent groundbreaking uh, innovations in liquid fuel technology, but it's still. Um, it's still a very important uh, part um, of that alternative fuel portfolio. It is, in, in fact, based on, on plant matter um, and, and a lot of it um, on land-based crops. So where are we as sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, you say uh, a small but not in insignificant potential is there for biofuels. What are we making at the moment? Um, not that much, um, and I want to clarify something up front. Um, um, just because something is bio doesn't mean it's green or sustainable. So we must just, um, when we talk about biofuels, we must always remember why uh, we uh, embark on biofuels. So this is primarily a measure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, if you uh, don't don't produce biofuels in the right way, you can even increase uh, greenhouse gas emissions compared to conventional fuels uh, based on, uh, based on uh, oil. So um, it's very important when we talk about biofuels that we talk about really sustainable ones. And for us, this means those that comply with the strictest sustainability criteria and um, then the best um, scheme that, that uh, um, ensures or, or the best approach is that one prescribed by the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials. So if you have RSB certified biofuel, then, then you can be sure that they are, um, they are, um, they are indeed green and sustainable and they, they, bring, uh, they deliver the emission reductions, which is what we're after, but also that deliver on other social um, and environmental benefits or minimize the risks. Um, these kind of biofuels are um, produced in minuscule quantities in sub-Saharan Africa. There is substantial production of 
um, less sustainable biofuels <laughs> on the continent. Um, and um, and uh, those um, instances are also one of the reasons why the, uh, the um, uh, RSB, so the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials, came to be, to make sure that uh, the biofuel developments that do take place don't make matters worse for the climate whilst wrecking havoc for local communities and the local environment in the process. Looking at your report, can you clarify this? It said sub-Saharan Africa, Africa could be, uh, could at best contribute between 30% and 90% of long-term alternative aviation fuel demand. That does sound like a big opportunity, is it? Um, we believe it is, um, and um, I'd really like to emphasize that this um, this uh, still quite substantial potential um, is. Um, is uh, for RSB, so for biofuels that would be compliant with the RSB uh, sustainability criteria. So this is the potential for biofuels that would not threaten food security, that would not encroach on uh, important ecosystems, that would deliver meaningful um, emission reductions, that would conserve um, um, limited resources such as land and, and uh, water. So. Um, the conclusion from this is that we really needn't lower the sustainability bar for um, for biofuel um, developments because there is a potential to to produce significant qualities in the right way. Um, having said that, I have to clarify that the potential that you just mentioned is 30 to 90 percent. It is a technical potential, so it is you know um, what we could get if we if um, <laughs> let's say if price wasn't an issue. So if we could really get um, every hectare of land that we identified as available in the sense that it's it's not needed for, for food production for, for people or animals or to safeguard um, ecosystems or um, doesn't require any irrigation and so on and so forth. Um, of course, the economic realities will be different. So the, an economic potential will be um, a proportion of this one, but even even if it's uh, even if it's 10, 20, or 30 percent of the global uh, uh, total global demand, that is still yeah. a significant yeah. opportunity. Yeah. So we're running out of time, but finally, explain why this won't affect food security because there's always this concern that farmers will find it more lucrative uh, to produce biofuels instead of food for the for the nations. Um, I'm going to have to go a little bit technical here. Uh, then, um, and what you just described is uh, um, it's called the indirect land use change. Now, if you if you want to claim emission reductions from your biofuels, you have to add to them the emissions that are caused. In these kind of instances, so if if the feedstock to produce your biofuel that you want to use displaced. A food crop, and that food crop has now moved into a forested area, um, and that's a loss of carbon there. You have to add those emissions to your biofuel. Now, this this um, makes it essentially fail the uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction requirement. So, um, again, if we if we say um, or we set the rule that only um, um, certified uh, sustainable uh, biofuels can be used to claim emission reductions, um, then in principle this should not happen. If, you know, if we do the accounting right and if we do the diversification yes. right and so on and so forth, there's a lot of optimistic assumptions there, but if we get it right, it, it can be avoided. All right, uh, thank you for those explanations. That was Tiasa Bole Rentel, a WWF's uh, Worldwide Fund on Nature Bioenergy Program Manager.